Um, my name is Heather Carey and I am an archaeologist with the Shawnee National Forest and I'm going to give this presentation today in conjunction with Mary McCorvey who is the Heritage Program Manager for the forest. Um, we're going to kind of tag team this so you'll hear both of us speaking um, and just kind of uh, piggybacking on each other when we have things to add. Um, so this is a topic that from our understanding hasn't really been presented to you before as part of this workshop. We thought it was really important though. we offered last year to be a part of this um, this year because we we want you all we we know that you know as natural resource um, land stewards that you uh, obviously have placed value on the natural resources that are on your land and there's a pretty good possibility that you also have some really important cultural resources on your property. And so we just wanted to kind of talk to you about that, um, maybe educate you a little, offer you some suggestions for learning about, you know, learning more about it, um, resources that you can go to to learn more about it, as well as just make a connection with a professional archaeologists that can help you to better understand your land. And part of this is because you know, we both work on federal land, but what is so important as a federal land manager is that the landscape or the land that you have, um, it really has a story of its own. Everything that has happened to that piece of land throughout history uh, helps to create the existing conditions on the land today. So I think it's really important, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, the different resources, natural resources you have on your land to understand those in a historical context. And so that's why we kind of just wanted to talk to you as well as, you know, offer you the, the opportunity to ask questions of us or ask questions of um, historical or archaeological things that are on your land that maybe you'd just like to know more about. So generally speaking, cultural resources refer to, uh, and I'm just going to uh, largely read off of this and then probably add to it as we go, refers to landscapes, structures, archaeological artifacts, and vegetation even that represents past human habitation and use. That's really the, that's really the crux of it is that everything that you see on the landscape or on your property or, uh, you know, was left there by someone in the past, whether it's a yucca plant or whether it's a log structure like is here, or uh, an inadvertently lost shotgun shell or arrowhead. Those are all things that have been lost lost or left intentionally by someone that has been uh, occupied that piece of property at some point in the past. Uh, they really help us to provide glimpses or help us reconstruct, uh, as Heather said, what, what the layers of history that we have on all of our uh, landscapes. And it is important for us um, it's to know what's on private property because sometimes we will find that sites on federal land uh, creep over onto, not surprisingly, because they didn't, people that lived here in the past may or may not have, have uh, 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 recognized uh, um, property boundaries. So you often find that sites actually uh, straddle uh, federal lands and private property as well. So uh, it's just nice to know those kinds of things. And the other thing it does, it just, it, cultural resources can inform us about our evolving re relationship with the natural world. Obviously things change through time uh, uh, in, in real life and they do, in the, they did in the past as well. So what we're trying to, what we're trying to reconstruct, I, as I said earlier, was all the layers of history that are actually located on each parcel of land that we have. And it's, and it does, it does create a fascinating tapestry of stories. Southern Illinois is extremely rich in natural resources, so it's going to be extremely re rich in cultural resources just because people were attracted to those uh, natural resources. So just to give you, I'm sure some of you are probably more familiar with um, the different historical periods in Illinois and also maybe like what you might find out there on the landscape. But for those of you who aren't so familiar, um, you know, professional archaeologists and avocational archaeologists, we kind of divide history up into time periods because it allows us to um, more easily communicate with each other 
uh, about a particular um, culture or time that we're speaking of. So um, we, we have the pre-contact period and that's gonna be primarily, well, it is gonna be Native American. Um, we divide that up into Paleo Indian, Archaic, Woodland, and Mississippian. And I'm sure that you've probably heard some of those terms before. You know, the earliest, um, the earliest peoples that we know of in Southern Illinois are gonna, are like anywhere from like 14 to 12,000 years ago. So we don't have, um, you know, there's still, uh, throughout North America, archeologists are still discovering very early sites and there's still um, a lot of work that's going on to determine how Native Americans originally migrated into North America and maybe where some of those earliest settlements were located. But that's the general time period that we have here in Southern Illinois. And at that point, people were very, um, very small groups of people and they were moving all over the landscape, um, you know, like moving regionally, uh, basically following the natural resources and the animals that they needed to survive. Uh, then, of course, um, throughout time, uh, people became more settled. And finally, when we get to the woodland period, that's when we start seeing some semi-permanent villages, small villages and settlements. And then, of course, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Mississippian period, which is where we get some of the large sites. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Cahokia, uh, east of St. Louis, that's a Mississippian period um, settlement, a very large one. We do have smaller ones here in Southern Illinois. Some of you might have visited Kincaid Mounds before, which is uh, owned by the state, or uh, we have Millstone Bluff, which is a small village uh, that's got petroglyphs and a cemetery and a number of other features. And that one's located on the Shawnee National Forest. And there's a number of other um, Mississippian era sites around as well. Um, so with those types of sites, we find things like lithic scatters, which is, so for those of you who've ever gone out to a plowed field and walked around and found an arrowhead or you found some uh, flint chips or, or uh, flakes of chert, that's what we're talking about when we say lithic scatters. Of course, then also sometimes you'll find uh, larger campsites or villages. Uh, we have rock shelters. We were just talking, um, Bob's gonna be giving a presentation here at three o'clock. Um, we, Southern Illinois is prolific <laughs> with rock shelters, um, lots of rock bluffs with overhangs. And of course, you know, who wouldn't use those as temporary habitation uh, when you needed somewhere to stay? Uh, we also are very rich in petroglyphs and pictographs. We have a number of those types of sites here in Southern Illinois. A lot of them are, have, that have been identified are on federal or state property. However, there are, I, I believe there's probably a lot more out there that are located on private property that professional archeologists don't, just don't know about yet or have, they haven't been discovered yet. So um, there are those types of sites out there. Again, also burial complexes. With that huge, as Mary mentioned earlier, because Southern Illinois is so rich in natural resources, um, we have an extremely high abundance of cultural sites. Uh, a main point of that is because we're located right in between the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers, which during pre-contact times, those were the two super highways that came through the Midwest. Um, so you've got people traveling up and down those rivers, moving, um, settling, moving resources. Um, so that's a big, that's a big um, point for Southern Illinois, why we, why we are so rich in archeological sites. We also have a number of really interesting um, sites that are uh, stone quarries. Uh, the Native Americans, of course, as you know, were making a majority of their tools out of um, chert and Southern Illinois is very rich in chert. We have a number of different types of chert that have different qualities which make them uh, desirable for certain uh, tools. Some of you may have heard of um, Mill Creek. This is a type of chert that is found near the town of Mill Creek which is south of Jonesboro in Union County and it comes out of the ground in really large nodules that can be easily worked and uh, they, they make great 
large imp digging implements, big tools. So we find Mill Creek chert hose all over uh, the Midwest and the Plains, and those were traded throughout throughout the uh, pre-contact period. As well, moving on, we have the historic period. Uh, Southern Illinois, we find primarily uh, Euro-American habitation. So we've got, we are part of the, generally part of the Upland South culture. So people are moving into Southern Illinois from Kentucky, Tennessee, that area. And they're bringing a lot of that culture and those um, material items with them. We also have a, a significant African-American population and that uh, occurs as a num because of a number of different historic um, instances. We have uh, large groups of African-Americans that were migrating to the area prior to the Civil War because uh, they, um, because Illinois was the closest free state. But we also have a large, uh, you know, uh, communities, African-American communities that moved to Southern Illinois uh, just right after the Civil War, um, once they gained their freedom. And so they established themselves here in, in Southern Illinois. Uh, and then we do have, a, you know, a very small contingent of uh, historic Native American sites. For those of you guys who are familiar with uh, Shawneetown, Illinois, that was originally the site of a Shawnee Indian settlement uh, during the 1700s. And so it's not a huge component of our historic period here in Southern Illinois, but we do have uh, historic era sites that are Native American related. Um, again, just looking at the list on the screen there, these are some of the things that you could possibly find uh, that are related to that historic period. Uh, I'm sure because, because uh, Southern Illinois was so um, thickly settled, there's practically a farmstead and a cistern on every 40 acres. So a lot of you probably have the remnants of old farmsteads um, on your property. Those would be, um, you'd find those by finding like stone foundations, um, the stone line cisterns, or maybe even concrete cisterns if they're a little bit later. We also have a number of uh, bridges and roads. Again, because we have the river, uh, there's a lot of really early transportation routes that run uh, through Southern Illinois connecting the two rivers. Uh, there's also mines and cemeteries. We do have a number of historic era pic petroglyphs and pictographs as well. And these range everything from uh, some Native American pictographs um, that date to the 1700s all the way up to um, on the Shawnee National Forest we have um, pictographs from Civilian Conservation Corps workers who were just leaving their mark on the landscape as they were building some of these recreation areas that we're also familiar with now. So artifacts are objects made or used by humans in a cultural or historical context. Examples from the pre-contact period might include chipstone tools, which is what Heather was talking about. Uh, projectile, we call them projectile points as a group. Uh, the smaller ones are true arrowheads, but you can also get larger spear points, um, things like that. Um, a lot of times you'll find a, what we call a ground stone uh, artifact, which is, it'll have a little, it'll be a cobble with a little indentation in it that would have been used as a nutting stones or to crack nuts. As you know, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots and lots of hickory and pecan and uh, walnuts, uh, you know, uh, as part of our um, environment down here. And so there's lots and lots of nutting stones that we find uh, sometimes by themselves, but most likely in a small campsite of some sort where they were actually har uh, harvesting the 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 nut. A lot of times, again, we find animal bones. That's not unusual to find all AWL that was used as a, to poke uh, holes into leather to be used as clothing or a bag, perhaps. That's a that's a very uh, common artifact. Other other bone tools that you might have would be uh, toys or a um, oh, um, something to scrape down hides with. Those are the kinds of things that you might find that were made out of, of uh, animal bone. And obviously, most of those are going to be made out of uh, deer bone, just because that's mostly what we find in the pre-contact or prehistoric context. 
other things that you might find if you're super, super lucky would be, uh, and, and when I mention things like this, it's things that I have actually seen in the archeological record, perhaps not on the Shawnee, but somewhere else in Southern Illinois, where um, I've seen uh, a, a bear canine that had been drilled as a necklace, and as well as a uh, Canadian goose tibia that was drilled to be used as a flute. So there's all kinds of really cool stuff that are out there on the landscape. Um, other historic artifacts that you might find would include, as you can imagine, broken plates, bottles, a whole variety of bottles from foodstuffs to beer or alcohol bottles, uh, finials for medicine, just very, those are, which are very, 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 very delicate. Uh, other things that you might find, of course, are uh, tools that were been used on a farmstead, nails, obviously, the type of nail that you find on a farmstead or at a site is going to lead you to assumptions about what that uh, house might have looked like or the, or the barn, for, for example. If you find big framing na nails uh, on your farmstead, on your property, that's going to tell you that the structure was a frame structure. Log cabins didn't use those kind of, they didn't need to have those big framing nails. You just had little finishing nails, maybe, uh, for, for windows and, and doors and things like that. But the other things that you're going to find are other things that people lost uh, and are probably very sorry they lost, such as coins, buttons, things like that, weapons, weapon parts. Uh, those are all things that you might find on, a, on an archaeological site on, um, on your landscape. So in addition to the actual artifacts, which are going to be the items that you can pick up, we also have archeological features. And features are defined be because they're basically non-portable. So they, they um, are a result of human activity, but you can't just pick them up. Um, some of these features that we find here in Southern Illinois are gonna be like the earthen or stone mounds, uh, buildings. We've showed several uh, pictures of um, like the remains of log cabins. But also, more often than not, we just find, um, of course, the, the logs have rotted away or they've been uh, demolished, but we'll still find the stone foundations. Those are really common. Um, chimneys that are left behind, both brick and stone chimneys and the cisterns. And even the cellars, um, a majority of the cellars here in Southern Illinois are just stone. Um, earthen cellars. So we'll just find kind of a, uh, you know, a square depression, square or rectangular depression in the ground, but also sometimes they are lined with stone. And then another really important one is transportation routes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of really important um, roads or transportation routes through, that, that go across Southern Illinois. We have several uh, very early roads that connected, say, like Fort Massac with Kaskaskia, as well as um, for those of you that are familiar with the Trail of Tears, uh, the Cherokee traveled through southern Illinois in 1838, 1839. So that was a very, that's a very important uh, transportation corridor that we um, spend a lot of time, you know, um, recording and working to preserve and protect that. Um, you can see there on the screen, there's also a shot of uh, the stone wall. I'm sure many of you who know, have read a little bit about Southern Illinois archeology span are familiar with the stone forts that we have here in this part of the country. So that's a picture of one of those stone forts. And those are unique, um, I think there's what, 11 or 12 of them uh, that date to the late woodland period. So that's like 600 to 900 AD. Uh, some of those are located on the Shawnee National Forest and are um, accessible for public visitation. There's others that are still, you know, they're located yeah. on private property that you need to get permission to go see. But um, those are a very interesting type of site that we have here in Southern Illinois. So that stone wall, which obviously was built by the Native Americans, would be an archaeological feature. Uh, also, you know, I mentioned earlier cemeteries. We have, there are cemeteries all over uh, Southern Illinois, and there's a number of efforts to document those. Usually there's some, some local historians that 
You know, I know in Pope County, um, Carol Crisp has worked really hard on recording all of the cemeteries in Pope County. And I know there's um, other local historians that are doing the same in other counties. Um, so those, those tombstones, uh, again, are archeological features of that cemetery site. So what's interesting about uh, Southern Illinois, and again, and, and archaeology and cultural or heritage resources in general, is that we have a lot of what we call or refer to generally as cultural landscapes. Um, it's a geographical area, including both cultural and natural resources, and the wildlife or the domestic animals that, that are associated with that. And it, obviously, it includes, if it's a cultural landscape, it includes a, a, an occupation by, by humans. Uh, what I have shown here is Millstone Bluff, which is I would call it, it's, it's an archaeological site for sure, but it's also a cultural landscape. As you can see, it rises significantly higher than the, re, the, than the surrounding forest uh, and ridges and, and hills. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty awesome site, and it's probably what attracted the pre-contact Native Americans to that area, uh, to that particular hilltop, because it was so visible from, from, um, from, around, from around it. And the other one that's, that is um, shown in this slide, in particular slide, is, a, is a Fountain Bluff, uh, which is on the Mississippi River floodplain, just west of Murfreesboro. And it is a spectacular area that contains, as you can see, it's, it's surrounded by the Mississippi River on one side and the, the Big Muddy on the other side. So it, is, it was perceived to be, be I think because of the proximity to the Mississippian as a very special place by the pre-contact Native Americans. There's a number of rock art sites that are located there. And there's thought to have been rock art sites located uh, in, the in the Mississippi River at Grand Tower. But that, that unfortunately, the Grand Tower has been significantly altered by, by uh, Euro-American occupations there. And they actually tried to, um, I believe they actually tried to blow it up to get it out of the Mississippi River to no avail, obviously, but it has been significantly ch uh, altered because of that. So those are the kinds of things that you would consider a uh, cultural landscape. I, all, I, all, I, I would consider a, 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 a whole farmstead. If, if, you, if your property, you have a farmstead like that was established in the 1900s, let's say. Let's say it was established in uh, 1851 when the land was actually selling for uh, 12 and a half cents an acre so that you could buy 40 acres for $5. That, that would be, you would have a home, you would have a, um, a cistern because you have to have that. You, you might have an orchard on your property at some point. You might have, uh, obviously you're going to have a barn for your livestock and perhaps uh, for storing your, your uh, crops for winter. You're gonna have other food storage facilities like Heather said, a cellar. And then you're gonna have all that whole area of your property perhaps surrounded by a fence. You might not be able to see that wooden fence anymore, but you might see some rocks that had been uh, toted down to that fence line and, and piled up against it. And that's gonna be, that's, that is a cultural landscape. That is, it's, a, it's an archeological site, but it also is a landscape that is depicting an episode of, of historical interest or an event that uh, occurred there. Uh, we're doing a lot of research at Miller Grove, which is a freed slave African-American community in, in, in Pope County. And that whole community itself would be a cultural landscape in that it would be made up of the, the natural features, the creeks that surround that site, as well as all the farmsteads located within it. And then, then there's a couple of natural features associated with it that were used by the, the occupants of that area, Sand Cave and Crow Knob. So those are the kinds of things that, would, that you would pull together to actually see a cultural landscape. Um, and, it, and obviously sites like Miller Grove uh, are dependent upon the natural landscapes. They are dependent on, on being um, hidden away. So you're going, you're, going, you're going to be dependent on the, not 
the, the cultural tribal ways, but also the, the uh, boundaries that are uh, made up of the creeks in that general area. It's, I think Miller Grove is surrounded like on three sides by creeks and pretty good sized creeks as well. So that, those are the kinds of things that create that cultural landscape that we we're talking about. The bottom of the slide is Fountain Bluff. That's the one I was talking about being located on the Mississippi River floodplain, west of Murfreesboro. Okay, so we've talked to you a little bit about uh, what you might find out there, what cultural resources are, what artifacts are, what archaeological features are. Uh, why is all this important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, cultural resources can really help landowners and communities appreciate and understand the effects of human activities and their resilience of nature. Uh, again, I love the idea of, you know, a landscape, a piece of land. It has a, it has a, a story. It has a life history. And you have to investigate that history in order to understand what you're seeing today. Um, it also helps us, you know, it's really interesting. It's very interesting to um, study some of these archaeological sites and and look and see how, uh, you know, like these Mississippian, like look and see how these people utilize the landscape themselves. Um, when you look at some of the small Mississippian villages, um, you can see and envision where they had their cornfields, you know, where they were growing their crops. And it's, um, it's just really fascinating uh, to be able to look back on that landscape and kind of imagine what was there 500 to 1000 years ago and how they were planning, how they were planning their own, how they were organizing and planning the, their landscape around them um, in their lives. Uh, let's see this, you know, so, so Mary and I are both professional archaeologists, but uh, archaeology has been happening in some form or another in southern Illinois since the 1800s. Um, you know, just as as a note, this uh, copper plate that you see on the screen here that looks like it has two dancing uh, Native Americans on it. This was a plate that was located uh, in Union County, Illinois by some people that were digging for the Smithsonian in the late 1800s. So, you know, there's, there are so many interesting things out there that can help us understand um, how both Native Americans and how people, um, Euro-Americans and African-Americans came to the, the wilds and wilderness of Southern Illinois and tamed that and how they developed the land to best suit their own needs. So what are the benefits of protecting cultural resources? Um, stewardship of cultural resources and landscapes protect the character and historical significance of a place. Landscapes provide scenic, economic, ecological, social, recreational, educational opportunities that help us understand our cultural heritage. Ongoing preservation of cultural resources provides a richer sense of place and quality of life for all and a legacy for future benefit, um, future generations. So the benefit here is, uh, in many places, and Southern Illinois is not is not a, um, escaped from this. They actually are able to. Um, a lot of I shouldn't say this. A lot of people have been able to take advantage of the um, some of the some of the recreation areas on the Shawnee National Forest as an economic opportunity. There are, uh, there are uh, snack stands now where they didn't used to be. There are campgrounds, there are cabins and other lodgings scattered all across Southern Illinois. And a lot of this is, is, um, can be related to not just places like Guard of the Gods, although it is, but Pounds Hollow is located nearby. Um, uh, High Knob right there in on the same general area has is the site of an old fire tower that was built by the CCC. There's just a lot of heritage here in Southern Illinois. Yes, the Fed, the state and federal lands do manage a lot of those significant sites, but there's probably a lot on private property as well that could become um, 
an economic driver perhaps or something that somebody would be interested in researching and contributing to uh, the greater sense of what Southern Illinois story is. A lot of it is just preserving it so that we always have it. That's, that's the point behind preservation laws that guide state and federal lands, is that we are protecting it now for future generations. And I think the same goes for uh, private property. Uh, there's no laws, there are no, or there are few laws, I should say, um, directing individuals and, and landowners to preserve archaeological sites, but uh, it is really a benefit to the future generations of the country that we are able to do this. And, uh, well, Heather's already titled this, but as you can see, this is the kind of landscape that we're talking about. Another part of our cultural landscape, this is the Trail of Tears that we've mentioned a couple of times already but this is a, a road cut in Union County leading from the uplands down into the Mississippi River floodplains. And this is the actual road that uh, Cherokee Indians actually walked on to get to the Mississippi River and to cross into Missouri on a ferry and to continue their journey into Oklahoma. So again, this is a priceless piece of history that actually has now been uh, designated as a sacred site by all three of the Cherokee tribes in the U.S. So these are the kinds of things that really contribute to the story of Southern Illinois. And I'll, and I'll just add to that, that, you know, we have the section of the Trail of Tears that goes through Southern Illinois is, it's one of the smallest sections uh, compared to some of our neighboring states. However, we have, um, I think, nearly eight miles of the original trail that is relatively undisturbed. And a lot of that is because of, because it runs through areas of Southern Illinois that have not been developed. In some of the other states, the trail is no longer recognizable because of the development that has happened. So again, going back to what Mary was saying, I think we have um, a really unique situation here in that because so much of Southern Illinois is rural and undeveloped. We do have some cultural resources and some cultural landscapes that are relatively undisturbed. Um, and I think that's different than a, in a lot of the other parts of the country. Okay, so um, locating cultural resources. So if you're kind of interested about what could be out there on your property, um, there are some places that you could kind of key in on to um, see, see if you have anything. Um, and these are, you know, as Mary mentioned, artifacts can be found anywhere. Um, there's random arrowheads out there that you can find somebody lost while they were hunting. But, when, but um, if you want to look for significant sites, um, the best places to look obviously are around water because people are needing water, particular landforms. Um, you know, we talked earlier about there's, uh, you know, quite a few um, bluffs and waterfalls, things like that in our area, springs. Um, you would obviously have to have water for both uh, people and livestock. Um, and then also, you know, we've mentioned a number of those transportation routes. So it's going to be where people are moving through. So looking, um, you know, re doing research and determining whether maybe you have some of those early transportation routes that, that traverse your property. So we keep talking about transportation routes, but I think it's one of our favorite things to talk about uh, because they are so cool when you see an old road cut on the on, on the landscape, when you're you're traveling down a, a chip seal road, and all of a sudden on either side of the road, you can see an old road cut that is part of the the original um, uh, cultural landscape of that particular area. That's how people were traveling to and from their homes. Uh, keeping in mind that people didn't travel very far back in in the 19th century and even into the early 20th century. The trait the I have found that the the transportation corridors that we have in Southern Illinois have been in place. And because they are topographically designed to be that, you know, that, that corridor. It, um, the one that comes to mind is uh, there's roads between Golconda and Cape Girardeau. No surprise, there's uh, corridor uh, roads that connect 
Golconda or Shawnee Town, and there's little connectors in between all of those that connect, um, for example, the Kincaid site, which Heather mentioned, the Mississippian site down on the Ohio River, to Cahokia. Um, and, a lot of, and a lot of these were established even before uh, pre-contact peoples were here. They were actually here probably because uh, they were originally identified, originally, They were originally, originally used by Mississippi megafauna at the time, going from Salt Lake to Salt Lake, Salt Lake's in Missouri to Salt Lake's in Southern Illinois, and in, over into Indiana as well, and then down into, into the Nashville area. So these roads are really, really ancient. And some of them can still be seen on our landscape today, and some of them can't be. Uh, some of, many of them have been plowed out, but you can almost always see a remnant somewhere uh, that would have connected it. The, the picture that I have on the, on the right is another picture of the uh, Trail of Tears over in Polk County. And then down below is a, a map made by a, by a surveyor in 1807 that is describing, or it's mapping actually the location between Kaskaskia and Lusk Ferry. And of course, Lusk Ferry was Golconda and Kaskaskia is on the Mississippi River. So this, they've actually as they were laying out the townships and ranges, they actually recorded roads when they saw them in the general land office surveys at the time. And again, these roads are used not just, they're just not moving people, but they're, mo they're moving artifacts from one place to another, uh, whether pre-contact um, marine shells that we find in some of our archeological sites that shouldn't be there, but they, but they obviously were traded for as well as other, other things that are coming down the Ohio River and the Mississippi River and then connecting inland from Shawneetown or Gawconda and are found on farmsteads, things like that. It's just very, they're just very interesting to study how people and ideas and artifacts were moving across the landscape. Again, I, I see that we're, we're about 20 till three, so we'll try to work our way through this. <laughs> um, so again, you're going to be looking for um, specific types of landforms, um, you know, uh, caves, overhangs, high bluffs, stream terraces. Um, I'm sure many of you who practice farming, um, you know, after you've plowed up the field, uh, you can look through the field and that will, if you might find artifacts laying there. Um, and again, another really thing, really interesting thing, and we had a call from one of the local uh, wineries not very long ago, trying to locate some early, early apple trees in Southern Illinois, but there are certain um, artifacts that you might find on a farmstead or elsewhere that are, that are remnants of that farmstead that you wouldn't recognize otherwise. Uh, old apple trees that might be on your farm that may not be necessarily very healthy anymore, but may still um, be bearing fruit. And then this is the, the classic uh, way to find a farmstead is uh, a wolf tree. A wolf tree is a tree that would have grown up without a lot of surrounding forest around it. And it was able to branch out and, and be a, a shade tree in your yard. And those are the kinds of things that um, you might find that are related to uh, human occupation on the landscape. So cultural resources um, located or collected on your property are a great source of pride and connection to the past. Um, now, so just to be sure, um, when you do find artifacts on your private property, they do belong to you as the landowner. However, there's protective steps to ensure that significant cultural resources are conserved for future generations and society in general. Um, again, these include doing research on the site or the property, um, inventorying it to see what is out there and then there's a number of you know technical services that can help you um, to better understand what you have and the um, State Historic Preservation Office which is under the Illinois Department of Natural Resources is available for um, consultation and help as well as the Center for Archaeological Investigations at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And again, this is the, the 
the point behind the stewardship of cultural resources is to preserve them for future generations. And it's the professional archaeologists like Heather and myself are, are available to help. But again, working with the State Historic Preservation Office or other archaeologists within the state, they can help you identify uh, steps that you can take to help preserve. And, and, if you, and if it can't be preserved, to at least document or record those archaeological sites, whether it's a standing structure like is demonstrated here, or whether it's a, a, a farmstead, the remains of a farmstead uh, foundation that you, you would like to preserve or at least record. Those are the kinds of things that we can help you with or, or this, uh, can point you in the right direction of finding an expert who can help you. Uh, again, there's a number of different um, avenues of research. If you, um, you know, if you feel, if you're kind of familiar with that kind of stuff, there's a number of sources on the internet that are available that are free of charge that you can use. Uh, and we can help you find those, point you in those directions. Otherwise, we also, um, you know, since we do this for a living, <laughs> we, we can usually help you um, narrow down and, and kind of focus on some stuff pretty quickly. And we'd be happy to do that. So again, as I, as I said before, as we've been alluding to, the, the point behind uh, doing this whole uh, presentation is to get you to think about cultural resources and be able to uh, recognize them when you see them on your property and then learn how to record uh, those sites for, for future generations. Um, and again, getting back, it, they might be prehistoric sites, they might be historic sites, but the point behind it is to be able to uh, document those so that we can, uh, again, just preserve them and, and uh, as a point of pride. Um, again, I'm going to go through this in kind of quickly so we'll have time for questions. Um, we can help you, you know, uh, if you're interested, if you do have a significant site on your property or you have an interest in preserving a site, um, you know, we can assist you in developing a cultural or historic preservation plan that will, um, you know, allow that site to continue without disruption or without being disturbed in the future. Again, just going through this, just the same resources that we've talked about before, the Center for Archaeological Investigations at SIU, Heather and I, uh, if you, I work in, in normal days, if it wasn't, in, if we weren't in COVID and having this as a Zoom conference, I would be in Harrisburg and Heather would be in Vienna, uh, but I'm pretty much teleworking now. How, having said that, if you just call any of our offices and ask for the archaeologist, they'll be able to point you in the direction. And the same for Southern Illinois University. And I think the next slide, go ahead, Heather. I think the next slide has more resources, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just go ahead. This is a, this, this is the, um, these are the resources that we, that are, uh, that are uh, at Southern Illinois University, Mary McCorvey and Heather Carey at the U.S. Forest Service, and then the Illinois Archaeological Survey, and, and, and then there's another uh, sister organization called the Illinois Association for the Advance, Advancement of Archaeology, which is a, a group of individuals that are, that, are, that are not professional archaeologists, but are very interested in archaeology and preserving archaeological sites. And I don't think we have them as a slide, but we're, we're happy to, to uh, be able to uh, share information about these. And I think the Park Service also has a number of resources that would be available to you to learn about something that we call the National Register for Historic Places. And that's kind of how, that's the guiding documents on how we determine what are important sites in a particular area. And then Heather, if you want to go back to the cemetery, one more or two more, I guess, slides. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, the, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has a booklet that you can download that helps you in uh, identifying and preserving cemeteries that might be on your property. Oftentimes they have, you know, tumbled down or they've been the source of vandalism or something along those lines. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a really excellent guide 
and then they also do workshops on preserving those cemeteries. Yeah, so that's a very that's a downloadable thing from the Department of Natural Resources that you can Google and find yourself. And I'll add um, here at the Illinois Historic Preservation D Division of IDNR, they do have a really nice uh, web page that also talks about that cemetery preservation and has a number of um, frequently asked questions that come that are presented to them a lot. So that there's a lot of information there if you do find yourself uh, a landowner that has a, a cemetery, a historic abandoned cemetery on your property. And and so I just. I just feel it's very important to, to share this information with you. Human skeletons, whether they're pre-contact or historic cemeteries, are, are protected by state law. So nobody's going to get in trouble if you have a cemetery on your property or if you find human remains eroding out somewhere that you think might be pre-contact. Nobody's going to get upset. It's just that we need to know those and they need to be preserved in place. And when I say we, it's not Heather and I, it's, it's the uh, Department of Natural Resources archaeologists. But they are protect, a prehistoric or pre-contact Native American cemetery is just as protected under that law as is a uh, cemetery with tombstones in it. And I'll just finally add um, the uh, Illinois State Archaeological Survey just started an initiative a couple years ago um, and you can see the flyer for it here. They are, uh, and, again, and again, as we mentioned earlier, um, we want to preserve and protect these places, but really what's important to us is the information that they can yield. And so uh, they've started an initiative to document um, private collections. So if you do happen to have a private collection of artifacts from a site on your property, we as professional archaeologists would be really interested in documenting that. Um, just documenting where it came from, what you have, um, probably photographing the artifacts. And again, they're yours to keep, they're not ours, but we're, we're just information. And we're really interested in that information that we can gain from knowing that that site even exists out there. Okay. So we have nine minutes. <laughs> all right thank you so much heather and mary um we've had a few questions come in and i definitely want to encourage other folks to um put some questions in the chat box if you want um we will we'll try to get to the ones we have time uh the first one that i, I wanted to ask you both um comes from a question some a post somebody put in there that they were digging and planting bushes and they found some rusted things or some um, stuff in the ground and then th that begs the question you know when does something become um, an artifact or a cultural heritage versus kind of junk is there a is there a difference between that or kind of how do you delineate from just old junk <laughs> that or um, kind of relevant items if that makes sense well we don't use the terminology old junk <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, identifies sites and artifacts that are in excess of 50 years old as eligible for inclusion on the National Register. So that's our, that's our guiding line, 50 years. Um, but also, I think somebody else, and I don't know if that's the same post I saw earlier, someone asked about, uh, a, you know, a dump. Well, dumps are dumps are, I call them discard sites. There are some, they're, they're, they're artifacts that have been intentionally discarded by, by someone. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the person that owns that land discarded that, it's someone. We find discard sites all the time uh, that obviously are not related to the Forest Service or, or perhaps even anybody living nearby. Sometimes they're really, really, really old and sometimes they are like yesterday. So um, it, it it depends on the context, and that's why you have to do a little research and homework when you're to work, when you're recording or finding these sites on your land on your property. Um, a discard site by a road is probably a discard site by a road because it was handy to dump a refrigerator there, or an old farm implement, something along you know whatever, or or uh, tin cans stuff like that. Otherwise, uh, it's probably more likely depending upon again where it is on your property or on the landscape. It may be related to the actual occupants of the of the farmstead. 
or the house that people are uh, actually living there. So, so there's no easy answer except for the 50 year part. That's the easy part. And the rest of it is all about the context in which the artifact is located. Okay, great. Uh, one other thing just about um, historical artifacts and, and do you all consider or what's your thoughts on historical ornamental plantings? And I, we've seen that if you go into the woods, you'll find daffodils or yucca or lines of cedar. And I know they are often associated with cultural sites. And um, what what's your thought on the, the relevance and, and the importance of kind of preserving those as a cultural artifact of the landscape? Well, I think you probably know the answer to that <laughs> is that it's part of the landscape. So it needs to be preserved as part of the landscape. Um, uh, Heather, did you have a thought of any other uh, thought? No, um, it, it probably puts us in opposition to some other of you, <laughs> but, but I agree. <laughs> it's, you know, it is part of the landscape. Um, it, the, actually, domestic vegetation, yucca plants, daffodils, irises, they, a lot of times they're a really big clue for us in helping to um, figure out where the structures were, um, just how that, the whole layout of the site. So those can actually be really helpful. They seem pretty, you know, menial and not that important, but they can be really helpful um, whenever we're recording the site. And we, and we record, we record daffodils and yuccas and daylilies and wolf trees on our, on our maps, just as much as we do the wells and cisterns and house foundations, they, they're just as important for determining what kind of things were going on on, on that property. Okay, great. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. One, um, and you've kind of answered that you're willing to help and things like that, but um, just is there a, a resource or resources out there that somebody can look at to see if there's known kind of artifact sites or cultural sites that are on their land or near their land? If somebody's interested in digging into the history of their land, kind of how do they do that? The, unfortunately, and Heather jump in here, but I'm just going to say, unfortunately, no, there is not a resource except for atlases. You, you're welcome to uh, check out any of the historic atlases for your counties that are usually divided in townships and ranges. So you should be able to find your property and if there was a house located on that or not. Other sites are protected by law. The site location is protected by law for fear of vandalism. Um, one more question. Uh, somebody just asked, what are the best management practices kind of for straddling the divide of managing pioneer cemeteries? So these are cemeteries, you know, that are within a prairie situation, managing them for headstone preservation versus managing for the native species. So you've got kind of a, a give and take between managing your natural resources versus managing your cultural resources and kind of... You want to take that, Heather? Sure. I mean, it... It can be difficult, but I think there are ways to compromise that. Um, you know, we have um, on the Shawnee National Forest, we have a pretty active prescribed burn program. We have done such things as uh, wrapping the tombstones in um, old fire, fire shelters. shelters so that they are not harmed and which, but still allows the, you know, the grassland to be burned. Um, so I think there's, I think there's, you know, strategies that can be utilized to both um, protect the cultural resource as well as, you know, manage the natural resource. 